<laughs> Please. And we are now recording. And welcome to our SCA virtual online class. I'm your instructor, Timothy of Sherwood in the society. Um, so thanks to all who helped with this class happening. There's a massive list because people taught me lots of stuff. Uh, YouTube, SCA, uh, books, videos, experimentation. Bev's a shoulder to cry on, my sister. So I could spend all pretty much the whole class just thanking people. But yeah, it's been a years long process. Um, let's see. Mistakes. I expect my students to make mistakes because I know I make plenty of them. That's why I'm getting better because you learn from them. So don't give yourself grief if you make mistakes uh, when you go to do this on your own. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah. One of the things I like to do as part of my class the beginning is say, this is the best I've been able to do. These are my arrows. So what I say, nobody's so far looked at them and said, oh, those are ugly. I'm not taking your class. But this is your chance to say words to that effect because this is as good as I've gotten in the better part of a decade of doing this. Um, right here we see I now glue my threads down so they don't get uneven when they go past the shelf sometimes. They get pushed up. Um, if you want to know where to get stuff or how to build stuff, that's really for after class to keep this part short and sweet. Um, I don't know if you looked at the... Uh, yeah, there we go. There's a perfect example. I can realign those in a few moments just by pulling them with the tool. Uh, these are much used arrows and so used that the shot knocks up and some of these are short so that's why they're in the house not out in my quiver they're for kids to use or me just look at and teach with so that's that's the best you can hope for uh, pretty much just a sampling of them um quick plug too great thing about this technique is you can pick any color of, of lights of course and any color of thread uh, i match them to my heraldry colors which are right there uh Ghouls, um, Sable, and or are all the colors. So if you have questions, please interrupt me. Otherwise, I'll just be whinging on. Um, this is more period. It's not every last step period, but that's what I'm working towards. More period as in more period than most people want to bother with. Um, I can teach you another time um, how to do really jazzy shapes. These ones are custom designed by my niece for her arrows. Did them with a slightly different technique than we're going to be we're covering tonight. The one what uh, we're covering tonight, we're going to cut a parabolic shape, or I'm going to at least. Um, there's a already cut one. And uh, so I'm going to do a bunch of show and tell, and then we'll get winching on to actually doing them. Uh, the big difference between, or a big difference between what most people do in the SCA and what I do as far as feathers are concerned are the bases. These are other profiles I can do with this process. These are just little pieces of wood. Um, great for getting flea market arrows, cheap department store arrows, that, and then the feather comes off, you're like, oh, what? That, I, don't, I don't know how to cut that. Well, after this class, you will. Um, big difference. You notice the front and the back of the base, which is the bottom of the, of the flight, I have left long. Normal ones, they chop them off, so all you see is what between my thumbs. No, we need those ends so we can whip them on. Um, this is a parabolic, and this is a period. Uh, this is not too well known from the British Isles, just as Timothy of Sherwood and Runes. Um, now let's see. What else do I have to do at the beginning? Oh, yes. Uh, I like to also make sure students know that this is not about doing... Um, knocks or points or documentation, crests, finishes, spine, straightening, form, etc. This is feathers, just feathers. We might talk about the other ones briefly, but that's not the point here. Simply to save time. Because, uh, it takes longer to do this class than actually do arrows. Once I'm all set up and going and I'm not teaching, it takes me about 20 minutes to do the wraps I showed you, including front and back wrap. wrap. So about the same time when you're doing regular ones. These are what we'll all be cutting. These are full-length milled turkey feathers from um true flight or your better uh, they're, they're the guys that sell them to three rivers and other sorts of online places um so let's see next on the list do, 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 yeah hoping to do two hours we shall see how long that uh, works out too um yeah to save time pm me for materials and tools and sources and such um I already said that. So yeah, we're going to cut flights first, or I'm going to cut flights first. And just since we're recording, I don't know if this will come up on the recording, but this is my uh, 
class handout I used last year, actually getting close with people who can freeze frame and get my contact info and read this. Um, and failing that, you can just, uh, you know, message me, say, what? I couldn't read that because of my, I'm Timothy Hills on Facebook, in case you can't read it there, tim.hills at newell.com. Archery organizations, I think, quite highly of at the bottom there. Um, oh, Don and just left the meeting. Hmm. Well, we now have Elizabeth, Maria, and oh, hi, Sharon. Can you hear us, Sharon? I can't hear you. Your microphone's off. I'm gonna click on it. See if I could turn you on. Turn your microphone on. Hello. And we Sharon, can. And we yep. can't really Hello. see that, so we can post a link afterwards if you want. Okay. Well, maybe some others can. I hope hope they can. So anyway, um, Sharon, we're aiming for two hours. I'm gonna a quick, real quick uh, recap of what you missed. Welcome. No harassing. The SCA harassment policy is in effect. Um, are you building along with this? Or, uh... No, not tonight, but you're recording, right? Yes, we are. And so if you, um, I forget what they said about recording. You're, get, I'm getting recorded. I think your voice might be as well. Um, yeah, that sounds about right. Okay. So yeah, I've got the list uh, on my post. You may have seen April 4th, April 8th gives you how to build the high glue jig and uh, where to get tools and modern things that you're likely to have around that'll work, even though I like to use slightly different things. They, you know, the stuff will still work. So let's see. I expect us, I expect my students just like me to make lots of mistakes. They're learning opportunities. So that's good. Um, back up real quick. These are my arrows that I've retired because I shot them too much. This is the best I've been able to do in better part of a decade of doing this. So uh, you can choose your thread colors, which is great because you can match them like I did to whatever you like. I matched them to my heraldic colors. Um, my arrows fly pretty darn straight when I shoot them straight. Uh, some arrows I made for a friend um, went on to win, if you're into accuracy, so many are. She won the kingdom championship with her skill and the arrows I made her. We are not doing knocks points, documentation, crests, finishes, spine, straightening, shooting form. We're doing feathers. So, you know, just feathers. So we might touch on the others ever so briefly. Um, hoping for two hours. Yeah, not completely period, just more period than most people shoot is what this class aims for. Though ultimately, I hope to aim, I hope to succeed in getting all at least plausibly period. So I think I'm gonna go on to cutting. I can show you, oh yes. This is the profile for our late tumor that we're doing tonight. That's uh, not too well. British Isles are, are known to use those. Um, parabolic. They're also modern. These I can teach a more modern uh, technique for cutting. These are my nieces. Ba basically, these illustrate you can do real jazzy uh, personal ones, but you can certainly do period ones. I've done these before too, even though we're not doing them tonight. Um, the same principle applies. These are just bits of wood with wood burning show that they're supposed to look like feathers. So now I have to angle this down. Yeah, I'm going to be working here, so I hope you guys can see that. I just get a cutting piece of wood for my cutting surface so I don't cut up my desk or whatever. Um, oh, I'm a little, a little nervous, a little excited. So what I do is I take the, uh, the feather and I bump it right down on that little shelf. You guys may know that on the one side, in this case, my where I'm pointing, where my hand's making all this movement. That shelf, the base sticks out. That side, the base sticks out a bit. So that's the side that I rest my pattern on. Now I use a fair bit of pressure, downward pressure. If anybody can't see this, please tell me before I start cutting. Everybody see this? Can't hear anything, so I'm gonna hope that's good. Can you guys hear me? Hmm, that's not good. Yeah, we can hear you, Tim. Oh, okay. Is that Bev? Yes. Okay. I'd like the others to ring in too. Can they hear me? Yep, we're good. Sharon. Okay, good. So, am I? Are my hands in frame now? They are for yes. me. Yes. Okay. So you can use an X-Acto knife. This is a period replica one, but I've used X-Actos for this too. And the idea is cut from the front of the feather where my I'm pointing here to the back. I've never tried the other way, but so I, that may work too. I just know this works. So I push down pretty hard and I use my thumb to push that up and hold it in place. Um, a lot of times when I do this cut, I have to fix it up with my scissors, which is no 
big calamity. Sometimes I get a really nice cut. I don't know what the difference is. So I'm using, I've used a bunch of techniques. I haven't found one that works better. You could use cardstock for your, um, for these, but then you risk um, coming up over it and cutting your fingers. When I have that extra, you know, thickness, about an eighth of an inch, then that's not a worry. Um, sometimes I cut into my, uh, my profile a little bit into my uh, pattern. So here we go. This takes me usually about two minutes to cut one flight. I like to time it because, you know, you do 36 if you do three feathers each. And that's how that one started out. And then just, oh, that one actually came out better than a lot of them do. So I got so much off. And then I can eyeball it. I, I don't know if the camera picks this up, but I can see where it's supposed to go based on the part that's been cut. And also based on the fact that I've already fatigued some of the, uh, I've done some cutting on there. So I just grab my sharp scissors are important. All kinds work as long as they're sharp. And just chop it off like that. There we go. Now for the front, this is the base. Notice I did not cut the bases, front or back. For the front, I figured out if I grab, oh, about an eighth of an inch there and pull, I grab really tightly. I don't know if you can see the little um, little bit right there. Let's try some contrast. You can see a little bit of white on the front. Can everybody see that? Hello? I'm hoping you can hear me and see that. Nobody's answering. Nope. Okay. Well, that means, to my mind, that I've tapered a yep. bit of that base down, so it's going to be easier to wrap yeah. it flat, get a little more aerodynamics, but just I like that. And the threads will be easier to go on it when I go to wrap on it. And I just do the same thing again. Another way you can tell is you look at the base there, and you'll see that there's, um, there's not green there where there was before in this case. Um, then I go to the back, and I don't need that much, so I just get in there and chop it off. Don't, this you can use for feather splicing or not. I've got so many, I don't know what to do with them. Now, this technique for the back is a little different. What I do is get my X-Acto or my period knife, and I just shave. You can also just take scissors and chop it along. The idea is to get it so that you don't have little bits sticking through if you decide to use really thin thread. I use three-ply uh, Trebizond which holds down the little bits that might stick up. So there we go. I just use the sawing motion. And you can, I don't know if you can see there's a bunch of bits still sticking up. So you just do the sawing motion again. Cutting blades, a little note on that. A uh, friend of mine who was a martial arts instructor said that the cutting motion is not pressure. You can push really hard, but until you get that sawing back and forth motion, you're not going to cut, even with the sharpest blade. As soon as it starts moving, then you get the cutting. If you're using martial arts instructor, you ought to know. And I've I've tested that with all kinds of cutting scenarios. So that's what you want: sawing motion um, that will cut. Um, I even heard a uh, stunt display uh, swords without fantasy where they talked about the difference between blades and how some blades are so much sharper they would just slice. That's still a cutting motion. Others are dull, and they had to actually um, slice with them when they'd be fighting. Um, so yeah. There you go. There's one of those. Normally, I have students do um, two, so they get a feel for it. But I just realized you guys aren't going to be getting a feel for it. The, if you guys want me to do another one, I will. Anybody want me to do another one? Hello? Hello, I can't hear you. Oh, well, I'll do another one. Just takes a minute. Well, why didn't you say so? <laughs> I can hear you. <laughs> so here we go. At least Bev can hear me. Can uh, whoever else is there, Maria, can you hear? I can still hear you. I can hear. I just, I, I can hear. I just keep turning ah, the uh, speaker off because okay. I got noisy kids in the back. So, oh, I see. Yeah, please give me feedback so I know that I, I haven't just taught to an empty uh, virtual classroom. I'm like, oh, boy, this could drop out any time. So even if you do what my dad used to say, when you're done, beep. Just make, you know, even a gurgling noise, something. This actually, I'm glad I did this because this shows you um, that sometimes it doesn't cut as smoothly as that first one did. Um, and what you can do sometimes, little guys just yank them off. Um, and other times you have to cut them. Oh, yeah, I've got a jog here too. Like I said, I hope I make mistakes. This one didn't go so well. So grab the scissors and eyeball it. You can actually glue them right on and uh, eyeball it, but you won't get, I imagine you won't get a uh, nice, consistent. Uh, arrows or pretty looking feathers. You get jogs like, I don't know if you can see, there's a little one right by my fingertip there. Um, so you just 
deep eyeball on it. And sometimes this doesn't work. Most of the time I get it. And uh, yeah, I have noticed that most people, I haven't had anybody say, oh, that's ugly. That's an uneven profile. Maybe they're thinking that. They're being nice, but I don't even notice it. After you shoot them a while, they kind of wear down too, especially if they're the uh, rubbing on the bow shelf as they get shot. Um, I use wood instead of metal because it, it's uh, believed to be easier on the blades. Um, oh, yeah, another thing. I just realized for some prep that I, I don't always remember to do. Um, so I'm going to do that same motion again. Sawing. X-Acto blades work just fine for that. Um, and right here is my high glue jig that uh, I've got the instructions and pictures on how to do it on my Facebook page. And if you want to pee on me and say, what? I don't understand whatever that is or where do you get that? Where do you get that? It's whatever. That's why that's out there. Um, I purposely leave the backs of, of my feathers a little long. Um, that helps with uh, putting them on later. And then what I do is I'll take the three I want for any particular arrow and I'll line them up like this. Right here, sometimes they don't match so well. The, the fronts can be a little off for this uh, profile. And when you wrap them, they're going to end up at the back a little bit differently. So I'll grab a whole pile and then match them up because my uh, my profiles, you know, it's a period technique. It's not, you know, machine pre precision. So in this case, I would probably go for uh, a little, you know, go looking through my pile of flights and find ones that match better because I had to cut uh, one of these down, come to think of it. And then um, when I find three that match, I get the profile on the back right, grab my scissors, chop them on the front all across all three, or sometimes just two need because the other one's short. And then I do a very, very little thing here that makes them look prettier. So I angle them along and I'm beveling the front. So instead of coming out as a rectangle, you know, if that's the front, I'm chopping there and there. So I, where my fingers are. So it's more pointed, more aerodynamic, prettier. I don't think it makes your arrows fly better, but I like pretty arrows. As my, my fellow archers will tell you. So let's see. Can you see that? Is that coming out pointed there? Hello? No? Okay, yeah. So I do that for all three of them. And nope. um, it's good if you can catch those bits because sometimes they, if you have thin socks or bare feet, they don't go, ow! You're just like, oh, I stepped on something. And so trim all three of those. Now, one, of, like I said, period-ish, um, I'm going to be repairing a flea market arrow I bought. I use cheese wax from Gouda or Howda, if you want to say it right, um, or Edam Cheese. They're great for just elevating that off the uh, the work surface um, while I'm waiting. And then the other thing I do is I take little bits of it, make little uh, things to hold the back and the front on. Because uh, I did a test a few weeks back where I shook the living heck out of the arrow with them just on like this. And they finally eventually came off after I shook them way more than I will when I'm working. Um, so we're going to get to uh, gluing. and Oh, I just remembered something on this one. Oh, uh, might as well teach you this too. I could do it without. You want to take the finish off so the glue is something to bite on. And I forgot to do that. Um, so I'll do a real rough thing here. If this has to be taken off, again, that's fine. The nice thing about high glue is it's water soluble. So it's also uh, heat sensitive. So you don't want to go shooting in tropical rainstorms and expecting your glue to stay, to stay in place. Um, the great thing is you can uh, take the feathers off pretty uh pretty easily when you break a shaft you don't have to throw out those feathers when you wear out the feathers but not the shaft as i've done you can get your uh, more bang for your buck and make your arrows look pretty again um i haven't used what i keep wanting to use and that's a um a blow dryer to uh to get the the glue to soften up but it's a heat source and i have much confidence that'll work i got to test that i've been thinking about that for too long and not testing it so what I'm doing right here is I'm just getting the paint off with my blade. I could use sandpaper too if I had it at hand, but I have it downstairs and I don't want to delay cl clasp. And you know what? I'm not going to take all the paint off. I just realized I'm an experiment. I doubt it'll work, but I don't actually know um, if this will stay on. As long as I get a bunch of the paint off here, little digs in there. Then the back, the back's already got it off. So yeah, I got, you can get flea market arrows, you know, people's old arrows, sometimes real cheap, fix them up, put them back in service. 
Now this is a uh, Trebizond brand silk thread. Great thing about it is you can get the whole rainbow of colors. I used to use pins to, uh, instead of the wax I'm using, and they were dangerous. They're more period than soft wax, which I've been trying to document. Red wax, yes. Magna Carta had red wax on it, but soft, I have yet to document. Um, there's petroleum products in them. So more period, but not period. Um, what I just did is I took a little of my, my, um, my wax off, and this is the nice thing. I don't have to put this in glue to get it to stay in place. I just push the, uh, the thread on there. It'll come off if I'm not paying attention. I jerk it off, um, snap it off. So now we're going to go to the high glue jig. Um, took me, I don't know if you read, but it took about three hours to make this jig. Uh, jars you can get at the better thrift stores or dollar stores for a buck or two. And I've used, you could use a, um, if you're wanting to get going on this before the uh, um, stores that sell those open in your area, I'm, I've used a um, measuring cup, a clear glass measuring cup. And then I got these off Amazon. Um, you can use toothpicks instead of... Uh, Instead of these little modified glue spreaders, quite a process for making these, but they're way better. And then I have probes. Toothpicks roll off and they, they blend in on uh, wood surfaces, like tables. So I don't like them. And that's why I came up with these. So what I'm doing now is just taking my high glue, which is on my handout. Uh, Lee Valley Tools sells it for about 15 bucks for a pound and a pound will do, I haven't measured it, but I'd be surprised if it didn't do several hundred arrows. So what I've done now is I put high glue roughly 80% around the area I just scraped off. And now I'm just gonna spin this on. And I'm purposely starting on the feather wraps, on the feathers rather. And I'm pulling this one back and a little forward because it was too far back. It's one of the other things I love about uh, wax. It allows for repositioning a lot faster and easier than um, than doing, uh, doing that with pins. The pins fall off, they get lost. I want to get different colored, um, different colored wax because I have red wax and I don't know if you could see it earlier, I have a red carpet. I lost a couple of these things, drove me nuts. A little spindle here I made for my own use. Some people use, use them just hold it in the hand, I've done that. But this is nice if I have to you know, suddenly put it down and run. Um, you guys all still hearing this? Hello? Are you guys there? I can yep. hear you fine. Okay, good. good. Like I said, make beeps or something. And I will be grateful. So now I've got the uh, the front somewhat fixed down. I could use a tool, but in this case, I'm just going to use my fingers to pull the front few uh, wraps down towards the points, even off the point a little bit. And now I'm wrapping them. The reason I started them up there is if I don't do that, they don't tend to... Um, Let's see how to say this. They don't work as well. They, it doesn't want to take that step up ever so gradually. But if I, uh, and now I'm putting some more glue because I want it. I need more space. I'll be putting glue over the wraps too after I finish them at some point. I can wait till I'm all done or I can um, do it right away. If I do it right away, then yay, it's done. But then I have to be careful that I don't grab that wrap and get glue on my hands. It's not toxic. One of our cats or dogs some years ago even ate some we left out overnight. So then we, the reason we don't know which, because nobody got sick. So I guess if we get really panicked with this, uh, this whole mess with isolation, we could feed them hide glue. <laughs> I don't know. Now I'm going to take some of the glue off, or the, um, the cheese wax off. I can take it off later with a knife or with fingernail and scrape it off. Um, for wrapping the feathers, it... Uh, for getting them to look pretty, that's a cosmetic thing as far as I know. I don't have any data to say pretty flies better, but it, uh, I don't think it does. Um, about 50 inches should do you for uh, the kind of profile that we're wor I'm working on here. Sometimes you use a feather or rather a, a tool to scrape off my wax because the tool doesn't make it soft and even stickier. Sometimes I manage to get it off with uh, just fingers. So I just took it off the, uh, the yellow, the index fletch. And yeah, it's easier to take it off when there's not uh, when you haven't wrapped all around it. Um, one of the things I'll do is I'll take my index finger, left hand here, hold that feather blade space down really hard in case the wax tugs on it, and then uh, 
get the uh, the wax off that way. This wrapping part, when I'm not teaching or chattering or being distracted, sometimes all three happens. Um, from now on, when I'm going when I'm going at speed, it takes me about twenty to thirty minutes, depending on how much I'm like watching YouTube or whatever, and getting up and doing other things. Uh, the nice things, I'm glad I thought of that. Getting up. Once you've started into the web, for some reason, you can stop, and it doesn't come all unwrapped. It'll still stay in place. Uh, I don't like to stop because I like to get it done, but uh, it's nice to know that you don't have to keep the tension on the thread the whole way along. I don't know why. I guess it's because the uh, the web is there, with all the, uh, the web of the feather, I should say. Um, so what you'll see guys doing um, when, they, when they're wrapping is they will actually click up towards the knock and then pull back because the web has that angle going on. Another thing you'll see is my right index finger here. I will support the web sometimes to break it. Now I can do this all day trying to get it look looking real evenly spaced or just get it done. Now well, somebody's yelling something in the other room. About I don't know what. What I'm going to do at this point, now that the front's glued, is I'm going to get some high glue and put it on my feather bases. Um, what I like to do is hold this little glue bottle right next to the shaft. Get one of my handy-dandy glue spreaders. Uh, and it doesn't matter if I spread it on the shaft or on the feather a whole lot, but I know if I get it on the feather, that's where it's going to stay. It's not just going to, you know, I'm, I don't always align it where I put it on the shaft. So I aim for the feather first, and I sometimes miss and get it on the shaft. Um bit about high glue. Um, there's different strengths available uh, from there's two strengths. The stronger it is, the shorter the, um, the work time. Um, or so they say, I've not really had any problem unless I um, water it down like crazy. And I don't know if the camera picks that up, but there's a very slight, in this case, difference. It's uh, darker at the bottom and uh, lighter color at the top. The bottom stuff is the faster drying, the stronger stuff. Um, can we all still hear me? Hello? Yep, hear you. Oh, yeah. Long delay makes me nervous. Gotcha. Well, that's because I turned it off in between because I'm getting dinner for Dave. Oh. Okay. So now I'm going to put the glue on all three of the wraps, all three of the flights. So I've done one. Um, I've done the yellow, the, the ore, your Herald. Like Harold speak, now I'm doing one of the sable or black ones. And you'll notice I'm holding it hands free just under my armpit. Um, Does that freeze my hands up to do uh, the whole, whole uh, glue thing? I have yet to encounter. Oh. Pardon me? Don't, no, sorry. Don't mean to interrupt you, Tim. I got to go put the kids to bed. Hopefully, I can log back onto this later. Oh, okay, I'll just keep going. Maybe somebody else will log in. <laughs> Sweet dreams. <laughs> See ya. Bye. Yeah. Bye. So I'm going to cover, um, I'm going to wrap for a bit here. Uh, at this point, I usually have to monitor my students because um, not everybody gets the wrappings to be enough. If you glue full length, you don't, well, obviously, people use modern glues and they don't use any wraps. But I like to use, um, I found that even if you wrap them um, full length, if you don't glue the feathers on, except at the front and the back, then your feather feathers can become misaligned in the uh, in the process of shooting. You can fix them in a few seconds, but you have to do it pretty much every shot. So that's why, because I experimented, figured, why use all that glue and make that mess and all that trouble? Well, that's why, because if you don't, then they, they get misaligned, which it's nice if you prefer to uh, change your alignment shot to shot. Oh, yeah, that one spun nicely, but I want a straight shot this time. Okay, then don't glue them full length. I just... Don't like to realign it. Was, it was a novel thing, but I just decided I didn't like it. Um, when you're done wrapping, then you um, then you actually do the alignment. As I'm going, I don't know if you guys can see this, but um, as I'm wrapping, I can push them around like right there. Because in this case, I can see where I've scraped the, uh, the white paint off and where I haven't. And I'm not going for a pretty wrap here. Um, trying to save class time. If I really want to get it picky pretty, then I slow down a little bit sometimes. But I'm more focused on you guys learning the technique. The wrap is just, oh, that didn't look good, like just here. You can do it again. Nope, too far. Uh, you can do it as many times as you want. You can spend all day getting a really pretty wrap 
Um, sometimes when I'm doing it, what I do is I look at the top of the feather and trace it down there and take a measurement between the last wrap and the next one and then look at the web. Okay, that's where I want the next one. Um, I hope that makes sense to people. Um, like right there, that's that's ugly. But this is teaching. And if you're going, you know, aesthetics, you, you can have gorgeous arrows. Doesn't mean you're going to fly straight. That's up to your form. So if you want pretty arrows, make pretty arrows. I like pretty arrows. This is basically a loner arrow I'm putting together here. Um, the ones I showed you were the ones that I, you know, I got the shaft and made them all. This this one cost me, I forget how little. It's so cool, old arrows and cheap. Um, I got a blob of um, uh, high glue right there. What I'll do is I'll wait till that hardens right up. And then it'll just snap off if it does like it has done on other arrows over the years. Rather than trying to take it off now, it's gotten to a gelatinous state. Um, if you're doing these for, I think it's the British Longbow or the English Warbow Society, they regulate how many um, how many th wraps per inch, which is a lot more than what I'm doing here. I'm purposely doing a uh, big gap to save class time. Um, just so you guys get the idea. Now, people say, as far as I know, they're right. There were no jigs in period. Well, I've been thinking about that a bit since somebody pointed that out on one of my postings. It's proving the non-existence of something. Something is really hard. Um, you know, prove there aren't any uh, invisible aliens in my room. Well, <laughs> good luck. Um, so did they, have high, did they have jigs? Did they have my high glue jig? Possibly is my answer i don't know that they had them but i when i built my high glue jig i built it with no plastic um i used modern tools to build it but anyway the finished product is at least plausibly period um more period than most people do and that's not meant to be sounding snobbish and i'm sorry if it does so almost done the end of this uh wrap and then I, if i remember right i'll do the um I'll do the parts of the feather because you can use, uh, if you can get them, I am still wanting to find um, goose and swan feathers. And I keep finding ones shorter. Um, and three different people send me uh, goose feathers and I use really long ones compared to a lot of people do. Not as long as some cultures. But um, swan feathers, goodness, never been able to find a source for them. Goose feathers, I'm told you just have a, find a hunter or find a flock because they do shed them, contrary to what some archery professionals told me. Um, Will Sherman, you want to look up a really talented period Fletcher, Will Sherman. He's over in England. He's on Facebook. And the guy knows how to do darn near everything. I wish I was half as good as he is. Um, he doesn't do videos, but you will see him on uh, on documentaries. And, as in, he doesn't do how-to videos as much as I'd like. Um, so now I'm taking the wax off, and this is what I was saying earlier. I like to have that uh, long feather base at the end. That way, when I put wax on him, the wax doesn't get in the glue nearly as easily. And I'm just pulling the wax off now. Um, so, just taking some more off with my uh, thing. Now, people do the, um, according to Mick Manns, one of the uh, other really period Fletchers I know of, put out uh, with some other guys a DVD that I recommend with conditions, uh, Fletching Medieval Arrows or some such terms. Uh, Three Rivers Archer used to sell it. And um, he doesn't tell you anything about where to get stuff. And too much of his uh, video says, make sure it's a tight fit, in reference to Knox, for example. And doesn't tell you how. Um, make sure you get good linen. Doesn't tell you where. Doesn't tell you how you tell it's good linen. So I learned stuff from him by watching that. But I, there's no contact info that worked for me um, for that. So now I'm just putting a little glue on the back wrap. I think I'm going to skip putting it on the front because I might redo this. But... Um, one of the things I do sometimes is I'll just smooth that with my finger. Um, that's a little high glue on my finger. It's not hot. I have autism, so I'm, I have a narrow range of temperature sensitivity. But I, as you saw, I was picking up my high glue bottles. And inside here is one of these tea lights. So these bottles get a little warm sometimes. What I also do with my high glue jigs to keep the humidity up, and I use a smaller jar and this also keeps the uh, the wind from robbing my heater, so I believe. And then slightly larger jar. And I put little grooves in these. Uh, this is an old stair railing that I did to keep it in case I get bumped or blown by the wind. And for taking my um, for taking the uh, 
these guys out. It's kind of like a pizza oven. Take a knife. I made actual uh, special little rectangles of what you call it of uh, metal to put them in and out after I blow them out. If I need to get out of class fast, and then just hang these off something so that the glue doesn't go where I don't want it. Now at the end, a lot of people do really fancy, um, or at least some people do really fancy knots. They they use extra tools that you can thread a needle. And I've tried a few things, and I thought, wait a sec. What am I doing this for? I'm gluing it, aren't I? So I don't know if you noticed. I just laid the end of that down in there. Right there is the end of it. And it's as simple as can be. I just smooth it into the glue. And I'm figuring, I don't need a knot to hold it in place. I've got glue. And I've been shooting it that way for I don't know how many months or years. Not a problem. Now what I'm doing is I'm lining this with my eye. Line that with the camera. And seeing, do I want straight? Do I want helical? That's one of the great things. Some people want more or less helical. And this is the way to do it. And as it happens in this case, sometimes I have to adjust them and adjust them. But this one's looking good to me. I'm fine with that. Uh, I've never had them really misbehave. Um, some people get real picky about how much yield, how little. Um, I find I, when I shoot them straight, they fly straight. If I have a bad release or bad form and such, then they don't fly so straight, uh, whether I do helical or straight. So I don't have a data to support this, but I'm rather doubtful that uh, all this fuss about special jigs is anything more than a way to, spell, to sell people modern jigs. Don't know, but that's one of my thoughts. Um, so that's how you tie one on. Uh, let's see. Boy, normally I'm having to take a lot longer to talk people through uh, all that. There's a lot of people are nervous. So anyway, feathers. Um, little class aid. Can you guys see this? Is anybody listening? <laughs> I might be talking to the camera for recording purposes. Well, we have the grease line. Um, oh, I don't have a feather right handy, but I might grab one in a moment. Um, there's a shinier part of a feather, which is between grease line and the quill base. That's where people seem to be cutting their flights, their profiles from um, in many cultures, unless they're doing flu-flu, which are meant to have really big feathers. They don't, uh, profiles, they don't even cut them. They want to create a lot of drag when they're shooting at birds or bird targets on poles way up in the air. But normally for SCA target shooting, um, we just shoot straight on. Um, so we put our profile basically inside that grease line. Um, that I've seen a lot of low feather profiles, Mongolian and English ones, seem to be within that. But if you have a jog where it comes part way along and then it goes down like that, that I'm told by feather, uh, uh, by f people who know about birds, that's from an immature bird and that's not going to be as strong. There's only six feathers off of each goose were ordered by Henry VIII in period for the war effort, for the Fletchers. And those are the outermost, the pinion feathers. Um, so, yeah, uh, milling the base is not something we, I'm talking about here. It's in McMahon's video, and he, he showed that he's not too experienced with it or at least adept at it. At one point, he, he splits a feather base and goes, and this time it actually worked. So I was like, I'm going to memorize how he got it right that time. Uh, I've got a bunch of feathers to practice on. So um, that's a... Uh, that's a bit on feathers. I chopped the fronts off, and back in period, you give those or sell those to the uh, folks to make uh, calligraphy pens out of. Nowadays, you can give them to your friends or, I suppose, sell them. What I do is, since I mix my high glue, yes, I should go on some high glue here. High glue is uh, made from animal hides. You can uh, find YouTube videos and such, and uh, Primitive Archer ran an article on how to make them. You can get it uh, a few places online. I don't know if you can see, but it's granulated. Um, yeah, I didn't think about taking it out. Well, I can sprinkle a little bit in. Maybe you'll be able to see it. So just a little, uh, not not spheres, but I'll call them beads for lack of a better word. That's what high glue, how it comes. Um, I've, I've got some. If people really want some, um, contact me. And uh, I've got some extra I got on closeout. And the furniture, the antique furniture restorers use it. Um, and they don't use old stuff. I've got really old stuff. Works fine for fletching. Uh, I don't know why it doesn't work for them um, if it's old. So the front of the feathers, I chop them off, hollow them out um, just by getting tweezers or sometimes it sticks out when I chop them off. And now I've got a period straw. I don't drink out of it for health reasons. People tell me that's a bad idea, so I don't. But I want to add water to my jigs, my bottles. That's my straw. Now, the common alternative, of course, is a modern plastic straw. 
this is more period so that's what i do and i've got a few extras if people want to pay postage or i feel generous and wealthy so that's how i load those these i got on amazon um and then when i want to load them with the high glue i just take a straw and I split it lengthwise somewhere in front of me i've got those um right here just made a little v notch in them i hope the camera picks that up just split them full length with an exacto knife or my period knife and that way i can go in scoop out some high glue add the high glue first and then the water because the high glue wants to grab you know wants to get stuck on the sides like all over the place this has a little bit up at the top there i don't know if that's visible I hope so um your contrasting background maybe that'll help it's more an annoyance than actual trouble and when it's uh, all dry uh, gelled i can just take one of my little mixers you could probably use a uh, uh a toothpick to do it too and this is gelling now on the end of my uh my glue spreader so i can just pull that off all in a moment reuse the glue um boy this went so fast because i didn't have to wait for people i'm going gee we're almost done i must have missed some stuff um so i'm gonna walk around the corner and grab me uh a feather or three to show you guys feathers that you should use if you get them if from you know from the wild uh your dry time i should mention for your uh for your glue it's going to vary depend on depending on humidity and your water content or lack of water content in your glue the darker it is the faster it's going to dry i find about three hours and i can shoot um shoot them if i want to oh yes another thing if i but I find that I've got lumps in my glue because I used didn't use the right part of it or I forgot to smooth it. I get a jeweler's file, a nice flat jeweler's file, and a matter of a few seconds, a nail file will work well too. When it's dry, which this isn't, I just file it off. Take too much off, put some more on. Um, and that's, uh, I'm thinking that's most of what it is for that. Oh yeah, you'll notice also on the back here that I've got these unsightly looking ends sticking off you can do i've done x-acto knives i've done this knife chop it off um uh, i don't like using those because i'll put a little unsightly dig in the shaft so what i'll do instead especially when the glue's still not set is i'll just peel it up as i'm about to do get some nice sharp pointed center scissors they even cut down on it like that and just either pull it off if i've cut enough or just keep cutting um now I'm twirling it to get it to finally break, and sometimes it's stubborn like now. There we go. That's one one little guy cut off. I don't know if you can see that. Um, and you can cut them, you know, as short as you want. If I cut them really short, like right up to the, the threads, I've had a problem of the thread comes off. So I leave roughly an eighth of an inch sticking past the, uh, the wraps. Oh, another thing about putting them on, I, I lucked out this time. Uh, I, before class, I didn't mark my feather wraps, but I did get a, a basic idea of how far forward or back I want. I'll put them all down, take a pencil, and mark them all across. I have this little jig that's downstairs. It's just like that, and then I push all the feathers along where my thumbs are, all the shafts are where my thumbs are, and I have, um, what should we call it? Um, I have rulers along where my index fingers are. And so I can say, okay, I want it here is where I'm going to mark it. I mark one, pop it in my jig, and I have a straight edge that goes across, and that's where I mark my feather fronts. I don't watch, mark the backs because depending on how much or how little helical I do, that's going to vary by a fraction of an inch or so. I'll know better where to put the glue when I'm back at that last step like I was a few moments ago. Um, so the other thing I do, too, sometimes I just wrap them on real quick i don't really care how much they're going on because like in this case i'm teaching other times i do exactly the same number of wraps for each one and what i'll do sometimes too is i'll take one arrow and that's the alpha arrow that's the one i marked with some tape or i could use um, some glue and that's where i get all my measurements for feather wraps and uh and depth of knocks where my crests the bands of color are going to be so that's the one that uh, tells me where to put all the others so that they look pretty Again, pretty I like, but I don't expect it's going to make anybody's arrows fly better. And I like pretty. I'm a big, big fan of pretty arrows. I don't agree. Fall, don't fall in love with the arrows. I don't shoot my arrows willy-nilly. Willy -nilly. I find that's the disrespect of the process as far as I'm concerned. And it also, they cost money and time to make. So I don't just shoot them anywhere. I shoot them where I'm pretty sure I'll get them back. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, feathers. So I'm going to go out of uh, mic range maybe and get my feathers to be right back.
Thank you for that message from our sponsors. I'll just knock some feathers, some arrows down. Um, I'd like feedback too, if anybody thinks, uh, can give me some kind feedback about what I did right and wrong. Uh, this is not a feather you want to use. I hope it's obvious why, but um, yeah, because it's a, it's not strong enough. You want a stiff stabilizer vein. That's what feathers are. There's your stabilizer fins, not veins. This one has an oil and grease line. I hope the, the lights picking it up is up there. It's obvious which side you use. This one I could use. It's a nice, long, usable portion in there. As you get towards the back, note, if you haven't already, that that uh, base gets really thin. It's harder to split. So we tend to, Fletchers tend to use them here where they can split the base better and get a nice solid base. It's also my belief that when you get further back on some feathers uh, towards the tail and further up to the front, then you have weaker. You get out of the grease line, you definitely get weaker. I can feel it just by touching it, that it's too weak when I get to uh, out of the grease line, especially up front and back. Um, there's, a, there's another feather with... Uh, I wouldn't want to use this except for hats and teaching because I don't see a, a visible grease line, or at least not a very visible one. And this one also, when I do this, I can feel that feels very weak. So sadly, only I, like I said before in my speed talking, only six feathers from each adult goose were suitable for the crown to use them in the Hundred Years' War at one point. Um, I guess if you're desperate, you'd use what you have on hand, but hopefully you don't get desperate. This one I'd use for maybe that much. That's what it looks like for strength. Um, these are gray, gray barred turkey feathers that I, I think I got these at the North American Longbow Safari some years ago. Um, so I hope that uh, answers any questions. Uh, is anybody on with me right now? I'm not hearing anything. So I, I guess I'm talking to those who are watching on recording. And yay! So I hope you. I'm will... still here. Oh, goody. I'm still here. Yay! Came back from making stuff. Any questions, either of you? Take that as a no. <laughs> no. No questions for me. That was very cool. Um, okay. Uh, well, glad for that uh, that feedback. I should also explain a little more on my high glue jig. This little ceramic white thing here is a potpourri burner or hot oil burner. Right in the top here, there's a bowl-shaped indentation that I put water in. Um, the reason, a bunch of reasons I built this. This works at camping events. Um it requires no electricity, so it's plausibly period. I want to get period wax candles and period everything here, but it's all period materials, metal, ceramic. Uh, the wire that holds these together for the, the little cages, I call them, for my high glue bottles. Um, I just took a coat hanger and a dowel, drilled a hole through the dowel like I was making chain, and just wrapped it all around and then cut it with uh, good shears. And then the wire holding those cages in place are from twist eyes, from bread. And the sheet metal is just bent up and cut up with snips. There's a little mouth here for adding water. Um, I just went to a what we call Looney Plus stores or dollar stores in America, Looney Plus up in Canada, and got some little bottles, whatever bottles you can get. I can even pick that up and just spit the water from my mouth. The saliva doesn't seem to make a difference. So you just fill those up in the tap, or sometimes just immerse them, whatever way you can fill them up, and then pour them in there. And I need to top that up if I'm working for hours and hours. It'll sometimes I go, oh, what's that smell? Oh, yeah, I've, all that water's evaporated. So that's how I uh, fill those up. And these potpourri burners are uh, $1 or $2. This whole high glue jig is under 10 bucks. And as I started saying, distracting myself, um, the double boilers that Lee Valley and other places say you need to use for high glue, you don't really need to but it's what's often done. In period, as far as I know, they just used a little pot, but you had to mix it, I imagine, a lot more. Um, with this, I, I can forget about it for a while and do other things. I even go out of the room. Um, however, you know you're in the SCA when you're out of the room and you burned your high glue and your neighbor smells that nasty, great big amount of high glue that I no longer use and thinks you died because it's rotting smell. It's rotting oh rotting. We called the condo board and, and said, I think he died. It's like, nope. So I apologize to him. But one of the reasons I do this is this creates so much less than double boilers do. And I don't need as much as a double boiler does. This could easily do, um, I would think, a half dozen arrows, front and back wraps, and knocks. I don't need that much glue. Um, and the double boilers that I looked at, I priced and priced and priced. And uh, the brand new ones, cheapest I found brand new was 70 bucks. This is less than 10 bucks. And why should I pay 70 bucks when I can save money and time and also not make lots of 
stinky high glue. Only one person has had any kind of reaction to this stuff just smelling. And they they took a my old double boiler and took a big sniff right close. And then they, they didn't like it, but they took my class and they were fine. So nowadays people are allergic to darn near everything. Another thing for wax that's not period, but really cool. These are, this is based on a Mary Rose um, spool. And I just use wax to keep it in place. So you just use masking tape until some melted in the sun, some glue melted in the sun, got on one of my spools and said, hey, there we go. And I can take it off and the red makes it easy to find. So I am so in love with wax right now. And then I just cut up some wood, put some uh, some lead to drum a little cavity in there, a bit. cut that. And then I've got a spool. Other nice thing, this is a little trough. I can put all kinds of tools in there, just keep them off the surface, keep them from blowing away and such. Um, now, period-ish. Once I master flint and steel, I hope to start using them for demos and such to start my fire to do the candles. But until then, handy dandy not period <laughs> uh, options here. Um, I did three different things for these because I think I'm pretty much done. I'm going to get into stuff I don't always have time to talk about. Um, I have different uh, glue spreaders, and that's why I have different colors. This is a sewing all. I'll be selling these if anyone wants them. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that. I hope I'm not in trouble for saying it. I just pulled the glue off. Um, these are so far have taken me, I'm doing another dozen in the last, last few days, taking me five minutes per, and I'm uh, going to add more time. There's little glue, little um, lead underneath the wraps here, so I can have these things sitting on things, and they won't fall off. Um, so if the glue doesn't go where I don't want it to go. So that's a pointed one. That's good probe also for getting in really tight areas, because I use the side glue jig for all kinds of things. Uh, you know, I built it for fletching, and then that's just a flat one. I snip them off and hammer them flat. I don't have any of the unprocessed ones to sell anymore. Finished uh, processing them, sanded those flat out, a very modern belt sander. And then these ones, I don't know if you can see that, but these ones are bent ones. Sometimes I like them better for putting my uh, putting my glue where I want it. I just stuck them in a vise and bent them. Um, that's some high glue uh, applicators. Uh, questions, please. So I'm trying to think what else I haven't covered. This is so fast. That's just in, not even an hour, and I've been through it. I, and um, no, no worries on being fast. But let me know when you want to stop to stop recording, and maybe oh, we we'll do. Um, kind of a little little stymie that I got it done so fast. So shameless plug, and maybe I'll remember what else I want to say. Oh yeah, tea lights. Um, even though I said I wasn't going to cover uh, you know, sources in class, I said that to myself. Well, we've got time. Little tea lights. You can get a bag of these for a buck or two, and you're good to go for quite a while. One of these will last me two or three hours. Um, I haven't timed them, but I know I've when I've done uh, massive sessions, these really last quite a while. Um, Tim, this yeah. is Una. Uh, uh -huh. Thank you very much for the training session. My pleasure. Uh, I work in the archery industry. I work for the oh. largest distributor in oh, the cool. United States. Which one? Um, but that being said, uh, your uh, class was extremely informative Yay. of the uh, historical based fletching versus modern. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I thank you very much for, oh, no um, you know, that class. Um, I do need to step aside, but I just wanted to uh, say blessings to you for taking oh, you. time um, for this uh, training session. And what uh, what company do you work for? Is that Three Rivers or Lancaster? No. Or who? No. I oh. work for Kinsey's Archery. We're oh. the largest distributor in the United States. Oh, so you're a distributor uh, as opposed to a retail place like Three Rivers? Correct. And Lancaster is also a retailer. Cool. So you guys do um, traditional and uh, high-tech archery, I'm presuming? Uh. Yes, um, from uh, compound uh, crossbows to compound bows to very cool. traditional and um, yes, so the full gamut from uh, from you know competition bows that you would see at the, the Olympics straight through to what I shoot, which is a long bow. So. Cool. Yeah. 
Um, do you guys sell high glue? Give you a chance to plug your business that way. <laughs> well, we don't sell direct to the public, so oh, that's right. it, it won't that's right. it won't yeah. help anyone. But um, thank you for thinking oh, thank that you. way. What gracious uh, and words. thank you for the class um, and blessings to you all. Thank you very much. Very glad you joined in. Um, yeah, that's very cool. Um, what she just said. That's wow. I feel like I'm in the presence of uh, pretty serious credentials there. And that's very cool. Um, so let's see. What else is I going to say? I just had a thought and it fled. If you, oh, if you do have even more temp temperature sensitivity for touching the, um, frame my face out, touching the bottles, uh, these are called cross linking tweezers. Um, and I, I would think it's surgical supplies that you get them. But as you see, they, you know, they're built in clamps. So you can use that. Um, I've I've basically abandoned you using these because these bottles don't get that hot. And if they do, what I do, I found I can pick them up and just keep rolling them as I'm using them, uh, because you know the skin cools as it goes. Or you can just pick them up with that, put them on the table for as long as it takes, you know, matter of seconds, um, and then they're easier to handle. Or I suppose you could wear gloves, but I've never had to use gloves. Occasionally, it's like, oh, that's a little hot. But I've never gotten an outright burn. I've just gotten discomfort. And I have a narrow range of temperature comfort because I'm autistic. Or so they tell me. Um, let's see. Just looking around to see if I didn't cover anything connected to the tools that I have laid out before me. Um, yeah. If you ever see me see this at an event or wherever, that's me. You know, you'll know I'm there. That's my uh, register in the SCA arms. I'm Timothy of Sherwood. Uh, I live in the East Kingdom, uh, Barony of Carolingia. Anybody's trying to oh, where? What was his name? Well, maybe you'll remember. You know, that's where you find me. I'm on SCA Target Archery, Quivers and Quarrels, Avakel, uh, I forget if it's Archers and Thrown Weapons, um, Thrown Weapons and Archers. Yeah, I'm around a lot on uh, Facebook, especially now that we're at home so much. Um, oh, yes, also for feathers, um, Lanc Lancaster Archery and Three Rivers, I believe, sell the full-length feathers uh, by the dozens or by the hundreds. Um, these vary in price in the last couple of years, anywhere from about 50 cents to one, um, even though you can't buy them one at a time. So what it breaks down to, to 75 cents. And in case anybody's wondering how dated that info, that's uh, just a couple months ago. And we're this class is happening uh, during the isolation in April, 2020. Pardon me while I get a drink. Also, if I get to Penzik and people want to you know, work along with me and take this class, I'm debating whether to go this year, presuming it goes on, or 2020, so I might be uh, doing Penzik it. Penzik has been canceled, just to let you know. Pardon me? Penzik has been canceled. Oh, good to know it, but that's understandable and sad. Yeah, not surprised. Um, so what's your source so I can tell people, please? Um, it's been posted uh, by the Seneschal on East Kingdom sites. Ah, that must be a, I haven't been on there. Rec How recently was that, please? Uh, this afternoon, so only a couple hours ago, really. Okay, well, that explains why I didn't see it. Um, so I'm thinking another class, actually, I'll solicit whoever many actually, people are listening. Do you want me to, let me stop the recording now. Oh, I was just going to do a plug. Well, yeah. Sure, okay, well, to... then, yeah, that's that's cool. I'll stop okay. the recording, and I'll just informally plug my class, because it won't it'll be dated. I'm thinking about doing a class for... Um, a couple of classes. One for how to make arrow shafts. This is one I made uh, from a board. That's the way I sometimes make them now. And I don't use sandpaper or modern tools. I use um, a fro. It's a L-shaped cleaver to split them out. And then, um, let's see, a side axe, specialty type of axe for trimming them. And then a shaft shooting board and two planes. And I'm not the expert that some people are, but I actually managed to make my own shafts out of hardwoods. Much more, period. I'm working to have a complete fletching kit that's all period. Um, even discussions get a period saw um, to do the uh, do the knock. So everything ultimately will be period. It's been years since I started. So that's one class I'm considering teaching if I find enough interest how to make your uh, shafts once I get a little faster. Um, it takes me over an hour to do one right now, um, just the shaft. And then I don't know if you guys can see, I don't know if anybody's there, but I'm considering teaching class on how to write stuff on shafts and keep it nice and straight. That'll be a real quick class. It's a really basic technique I figured out, and that's dwarf runes, in case anybody's wondering. So it's 